What's up, guys? I am casting to you at 7 o'clock on Tuesday for Game Builder class at UCODIT. So hope you're doing well tonight. If you are out there on the Eline Media Twitch channel, just chat me and let me know you're here. I'm hanging out here with Christian's Unity Project. Uh, I was emailing with Christian just a bit right before this to do some troubleshooting. And I thought I would kick the cast off by talking about some little tweaks, some little things that uh, I was working with Christian on. Hey, Christian, I see you there in the chat. Good to see you. Uh, I'm going to talk about this lamp here on the side table in just a minute. So. Um, Hold while I continue to just wait a bit and let folks roll in here. I do see uh, there's some beautiful blue walls in this game. I'm very excited to see that. And that means that Christian, of course, has elaborated on this from what we saw last week. This is becoming a really really top-notch level design for this, this game with the dog, and I'm just really impressed with it. So really excited to talk about this and hoping a few other members of our You Code It team roll in today. Um, Francis, Thomas, hopefully Greg. Hey, Ali, good to see you on the chat. Hope you're doing well this week. Um, would love to hear one word from you guys to describe the past week. I always think of that now when I hear the... <laughs> oh, here's Thomas coming in with a Thomas word. I love it so much. <laughs> oh my gosh, welcome. It's good to see you guys all here. Uh, I really miss the days when we were all face to face. It's just always... Poignant, I guess, is a good word if you wanted to if you wanted to choose one. Relaxing, awesome. So Ali is saying relaxing in the chat. That's great. Yeah, I mean, we're coming to the end for university students of the semester, I think, and some people have even been graduating online, which is weird. Meanwhile, I think the folks in middle school and high school probably have a little bit longer before before it's time to dive into the summer, which is going to be very much like the spring, but maybe a little bit less online school. So hopefully you can find something else to do inside, maybe making games. I don't know. Ah, it's crazy these days. It's crazy. Uh, but the good news from my end is I have upgraded my internet. So we have fancy new router, which we kicked things off with last week, and that worked excellent. And then this week, we finally upgraded our internet speed here at my apartment in Manhattan. So all of the possible things you could do to make these streams just be A plus has been done, and I should not buffer or cut out. Of course, if it happens, be patient. I will do my best to reconnect to you as soon as I can within the hour if something goes wrong. But my hope is that it won't go wrong this time and that we'll just be able to work on some really great game stuff for the next hour, right up to eight o'clock. Uh, and then at eight o'clock, of course, I will be in my office hours, which you know, you can click on the link in the email that comes from Haley each week to join me. Um, I'm there from eight to eight thirty, and it's a Google Hangout call. Um, I've seen Christian in there. I've seen Greg in there. Um, you can join for five minutes and ask me a question and then leave. Um, it's super low key. You don't even have to turn on your video. Um, I'm just sitting there. You'll see my face like this and I can help you um, with any questions you guys have. Um, but before we get started, I would love to, to know if you guys do have any questions at this juncture about your game projects that I could answer before I get started on doing some development here. I was going to demonstrate some stuff in Christian's project and um, try to, again, show you guys some things that would apply to everyone's game work. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, I think, would actually apply to Thomas's game and Christian's game. 
So even though I'll show it in Christian's project, um, Thomas, this goes out to you too, and it has some general um, sort of a back end might be a word, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about scripting and setting up the, the gameplay today with UI, which I talked about last time, and interactions in the level. So I've got that on the slate and hopefully it's helpful to you guys. But if you do have any comments or questions, things you want me to talk about, I'm asking you right now to let me know, put that in the chat uh, and let me know what I could address or solve for you. Of those who are in the chat right now, I just wanted to provide an update that um, Christian, uh, obviously I've got your project on the screen here and you know, you're hitting your goals each week. Um, I'm really impressed with this. You know, every time I pull the project, it's updated and this is ready for us to move into the next stage, which is UI. Uh, we could do audio very soon and we're also going to do some game state management which involves how do you win? So really excited about Christian's project. And then um, for Thomas's project, since I know you're there in the chat, Thomas, I, um, I wanted to let you know that I see um, in my Unity Hub, I see two versions of your project. Um, I think, what is it called? I'll actually just show you it here because uh, I can just pull it up real quick. But um, what I see when I open Unity Hub here is two versions of the project here. I've got Together But Alone and Together But Alone What? And, you know, this is actually a fairly common, um, a fairly common occurrence to end up with a duplicate. I've seen it happen before. Um, it's, it's a weird thing that can come up when you're opening and using projects. Like, sometimes it'll happen if you open Unity using the link at the bottom of the screen in the start bar instead of hub. But I wanted to let you know that um, if possible, if you continue working on the game, if you could do it in the this one, the, the one that doesn't have the one in parentheses after it, and then just delete the other one, then we won't get confused where we're both editing both games. Um, the only caveat to that um, would be if you already did a bunch of additional work in this one. Um, if that's the case, just let me know and I'll download this one and work on this one with you from now on. So you could let me know which which one of those you want me to do. But unless you've worked on this second one, this duplicate, then I would I would try to keep all of your changes in this together but alone. All right. So I'm going to kick off with some stuff about Christian's project. Great job, Christian. This is so cute. So if you've been following along, I know Christian's been here every week and one of the most diligent game makers on our team. Um, last week I talked about materials, which is how you add color and texture to object in a game. And Christian has outfitted this house he's been building with blue walls. I'm so excited. Um, I'm going to actually just like kind of cruise around in here a little bit. Um, we've actually got some really nice interior walls painted that sort of off-white color as well, which is, of course, the material I made last time, sort of trying to imitate like neutral house paint. And this just looks so, so realistic now. We've got this like wooden floor and then these sort of soft walls inside. So much better than those glowing white walls, which are the default uh, that you get when you create uh, a Unity primitive. Um, we've got this really nice room here with this glowing lamp, this couch. 
going to cruise over here into this lovely, lovely kitchen. And he's been building out a bathroom, which I love bathrooms in video games so much. <laughs> it's so weird, but like, it just seems so realistic. You're like, oh my gosh, there's a bathroom. So I just love that this is part of this house. Um, and I even noticed in here that Christian has gone to the trouble to tile the walls. It just looks so, so pro. I love this so much. I'm going to move this to it. It looks a little bit to the left. I love it. There's just so many good things about this. And we've got a shower curtain over here. We've got wall tile walls. And I just, I'm seeing this level really coming together. Um, doesn't this look nice? We started with nothing, and over the weeks, this has really become something cool. So what I was talking to Christian about, okay, Christian's saying, I have a problem with the collider for the shower. Let's visit that. Um, I'm going to start actually with the um, this lamp. And right before I started the cast, Christian and I were talking and trying to figure out, like, why this lamp was dropping through this right here. Um, so Christian, I think, was trying to set this um, set this object up with a collider and a rigid body so that the dog can run into this lamp and knock it over, which is the main mechanic of this game. Um, so let's see if I can get, get myself actually clicking on this. There it is. Um, so what to do? Um, my solve on this was to add a box collider rather than a mesh collider. Hey, Francis, I see you in the chat. So uh, essentially what was going on here is Christian is adding a mesh collider. And I actually set this up so I could see what was happening because he said, the lamp is disappearing when I play the game. And the way I set this up to troubleshoot, uh, normally, you know, when you do the, this looks kind of weird because the camera's upside down, but um, normally when you put the windows in the default configuration, the game window is behind the scene window. So when I press play, that this window pops up and let's press play so you can see that. Now I'm in the game. Um, however, one thing that's really useful in Unity is even while the game is running, you can actually still open the scene window and see what's happening. And as you can see right here, I reproduce Christian's bug and the lamp is not there. So I'm like, OK, I need to see what happens to that lamp right when I press play, because it's there when I'm editing the scene. And then when I press play to run the game, it's disappearing. So the way I did that, and you can do this too if you want, is I actually took the game window and I put it down here. Whoops. Easy to mess this up. So if you drag something into a weird location in Unity, just uh, drag it a around a little bit. There we go. You can just like, you know, it kind of glues to stuff. It's like, duh, duh, you know, and it doesn't work the way you expect it to. So you got trial and error. Um, but I, this is where I wanted it to go. I wanted to see it here, um, just in a little square and then look at the scene when I hit play, because now the game is like this tiny little square and I can play in the square, but I'm really interested in what's happening in the scene. So I press play here and it's just dropping through. That is, why is it doing that? You know? So, of course, I, I hit play again to get out of the game. There it is. And my sense was that there is some kind of weird interaction happening with this mesh collider. It's something buggy about it. So I said, you know, a mesh collider is computationally expensive. And I said, oh, you know what? It might just be easier to have this be a box collider. Um, and one of the nice things about a box collider is if you want it to sit upright, it's going to have like a square base. So it's sitting nicely and it'll still look natural when the dog runs into it because you can't see the box. 
So I actually put a box collider and not a mesh collider on it. And now I'm going to run it and just see. Yeah. So something weird with the mesh collider, but with the box collider, it's working pretty well. Um, I'm going to jump the dog up there and just see if I can push it off, which because I think that was Prince Christian's. Uh, oops. Oh, my gosh. It's hard to get the dog up there. Whoa. <laughs> there we go. So it does work. I'm also noticing that like I can jump through the ceiling. Uh, that's a, another thing that we could debug. Um, perhaps our goal in this house would be to make the ceiling a bit higher than it would be in reality so that this, um, this doesn't happen. Which is, of course, the camera that's following the dog is cutting through the ceiling and looking at it from the top. Uh, I actually noticed this game is inspired by the game Dante's Infernia, which I showed in early April. And in that game, a cat is running around. And I noticed in that game, if you look at that game and play, replay it now, the ceiling in that game is like 100 feet in the air. And I think the reason why is to avoid having the camera clipping into the ceiling. So. That's a minor problem, though, like normal thing to have happen, something that you troubleshoot in the course of making a level. So let's now that we've gotten that lamp to kind of work. Oh, my gosh, it's really that's so funny looking with the light sticking out of it. I really like it. Um, good. I feel like the dog is a little bit hard to control. I feel like we could work on that, too. But. I'm always obsessed with optimizing an avatar to feel natural, to move around. And really, that's not something you would do until you've got this, um, this UI set up first, which is hopefully what I'll talk about today. Um, I see Francis in the chat saying my thing is having upload issues. That is weird. Uh, while you're here, let me know what kind of upload issues you're having, and maybe we can troubleshoot that. Oh, I see Greg. Greg, welcome back. Good to see you. I'm going to slide into the bathroom and talk about the collider issue with the shower. All right. So, Christian, let me know what your um, collider issue is here. So, this is interesting. It's weird that there would be a shower curtain behind the bathtub. Shouldn't that be in front of the bathtub? Interesting. Um... Christian, let me know what's going on with this and I'll try to fix it. Um, it does look again like we've got, oh yes, I see. We've got a mesh collider attached here. Got it. Yeah, let's run the dog in there and we'll see what happens. Actually, this is a good time for me to show an example of something that's a really nice Thing you can do to test your games, kind of like putting the game down here. Um, if I want to test in this area, one thing I can do is just move the dog over there. So let's see if I can find where in the world is the dog and all of this. Well, I'm going to search for the dog. Let's jump to him. And then I actually feel like why not just move the dog oops, into the bathroom so I can test? So I just really sometimes like this is a little bit unnecessary because, you know, I can get into the bathroom in like five seconds. But let's say, for example, that you had a really big level and you were like, I need to test something in the corner of that level. And I do not want to run over there every single time. Well, one way that you can make it easy on yourself is to just put your avatar in the room. 
So I'm kind of just weirdly moving him over. This is probably not the most efficient way, but okay, here, now he's in the bathroom. <laughs> so, you know, it depends on what you want to do. But like now that he's in there, I every time I hit play, I don't have to like, oh, I'd have to run through the house again. So, all right. So I've moved the dog. I'm going to leave the game down in that little square so I can see both places. So look down at that square to see what I'm doing. And it's cool to see, right, like in the scene, you can see him moving and he's got that little um, move gizmo attached to him because if I wanted to, I could even in the game, I could move the dog just to try testing things, right? Like, oh, what if I want him over here? All right, but let's go here and try to jump. Wow, that is really weird. So we've got some kind of like mysterious like collider in here. This reminds me of the, um, the, when we had the like multiple beds overlapping with each other. So it makes me wonder if there's multiple colliders hiding in this. All right. So obviously we don't want that. We want the dog to jump in the bathtub probably um, when he jumps. So <laughs> cool. Let's see. Hmm. Well, we've got the shower up here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the game here for a minute and perhaps just start to investigate. So that's a shower. We've got a mesh collider on it. Um, let's actually try removing this, and then we'll just see what does the dog do. See if it's the same. Yeah. So we've got that same thing somewhere. And it seems like it's not on that shower in a way. Because. Interesting. This one also has a mesh collider. Let's take this one off. I'm going to take them all off. Yeah. All right. We're going to just like take everything off. Check this out. Let's see if the let's see if that fixes it. Hmm, yeah. So that was interesting. And now I'm gonna actually kind of add it back in. This is weird, but let's just see if I add it again, if it does that same weird behavior or if it if it uh fixes itself. Yeah, you know what? There is just something really weird about that mesh collider that was attached to it originally. I wonder if maybe the part, there's something to do with the fact that that curtain in the back also has one. I don't know. I'm tempted to say it might even be worth using a box collider instead and just sort of letting the dog pass through this, the curtain. Um, it's up to you. I, I think taking that coll mesh collider off and then putting it back on actually sort of fixed the issue, which I don't know why it was having that issue. Um, oh, look, he's nodding. Look at that's so funny looking. Um, but it, it's a little, it's just a little bit weird that he can stand on that. Um, you know what I think might actually be the best thing to do would be to like, oh, right. Move this just like against the wall. And I'm going to need to turn it a little bit to adjust according to the angle of this wall. But, you know, let's move it like that. And then the dog's not going to be able to jump behind it. I mean, I'm just going to see how this looks. Of course, this will revert. Yeah, that seems a little bit better. That way he doesn't get behind it or like really jump up on the top of it. Yeah. Not perfect, but. It's one of those things, like, honestly, half of the stuff you do in Unity, it's like, I have no idea why it's broken. I'm going to reconstruct it from scratch and see if it still does that. Um, and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So, so I want to show you guys one more thing about this troubleshooting stuff where we've got the game down here and 
you know, I'm playing with the game while it, while it's still running. So you see the play button is still down and you notice I was editing this. So with that in mind, watch what happens when I press play and turn the game off. It's back in the original position. So the reason why that does that is so that when you're playing the game, you can try things out and see if they work. And then when you get out of the game, it puts everything back the way it was when you push play originally. So this is why when we do games in real life at You Code It, I always am like, push play to get out of the game. Push play to get out of the game. And that is because I don't want you to make changes and then have it magically undo the changes. But sometimes it can be nice to run the game and make little edits like that just to see if your idea for how to fix it is going to work. So like I was like, I wonder how the dynamic would be if I slide this against the wall and I'll just test it out real quick, really roughly move it over. Oh, yeah, that seems better. Right. And then now that I've gotten out of the game. Um, I can actually start the process of doing this, which obviously, you know, we have some kind of situation here where the wall is at a slightly different angle from this. And this will be up to you, Christian. You'll just want to do a little bit of adjusting and level design here. So we've solved a couple collider and level design issues using some good practices for troubleshooting. And I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about UI before I it gets too late. Um, I see, Francis, you're saying I'm getting a missing file error for the collab. That's weird. Can you send me a screenshot of that? Um, you, I know you've sent me screenshots before, so send me a screenshot of that one so we can troubleshoot. I'm not sure. I'm not sure initially what would be going on there, but if I could see a screenshot, it'll help me. It'll help me figure it out. Um, so, yeah. So I wanted to talk about UI a little bit. And to do that, I'm actually going to, I'm going to reset this so that that game window isn't a little square. And just as a reminder, if you want to reset, you know, if you're dragging things around, like, like, oh, la, da, you know, you guys know what to do. Window layouts default. And here I am back in my scene, and everything is the way it normally looks. Okay, so I unroll this. And last week I was talking about UI, which is the, the stuff you see on the screen. So in a video game, anything that you see that gives you a health bar or points. Items, inventory, buttons, anything that's sitting there on the screen while you're playing, we call that UI. And I had actually worked on UI a little bit in Thomas's game, where I added some text at the top to count how many um, pieces of furniture had been pushed into their triggers. So that was an example there. And here in Christian's game, I was setting up something similar, which is how many knockable objects the dog has knocked over. So I'm going to head to my UI design for this game. And Christian, you can do this too. And Thomas, it works the same way in your game. It's generally this way when you prototype a project like this. Um, the UI is contained in an object here called Canvas. And to be able to see that, I need to click on 2D, and then I'll double click on the canvas. And now I can see what is going to kind of display over top of the camera when I'm looking at my game. Just notice my aspect ratio looked a bit wide. So I'm setting this on 16 by 9 because that's a fairly standard aspect ratio. The free aspect one just fills up whatever the size of the box is. And I want to use an aspect ratio that's common, like, in other words, the size that's similar to most computer monitors. Um, so I just switched that there. 
And I have this nice rectangle now with objects knocked over. And again, Thomas, if you're listening, this should look very similar to the way I set your game up with, um, I forget what I wrote in the, in the UI for yours, but I had put this line of text up in the corner that was similar to this. Um, and the thing I wanted to address here is how do I get this text to respond to what's happening in the game? How do I do that? Um, because now, of course, when we run the game, it's just objects knocked over, right? And nothing actually, you know, I can run, oh, well, that one doesn't knock over. I can knock things over and we don't see any numbers, you know? We just see this text sitting. Take that one. Nope, can't knock that one yet. One of these bases, I know. Yes. No. Aha! Goodbye! Yes. But then, of course, we don't get anything. And what we would like to happen is when I hit that, this thing has the one next to it instead of nothing. Because what we're trying to figure out is how do I get points? How do I win the game? And the UI is helping give me that information. So we need to figure out how to set that up. And to do that, um, Thomas is lucky because he already has it in his game. But I wanted to show you guys a little bit about how it works when you set up that kind of interaction. And to do that, I need to draw a little picture. So be prepared for some incredibly exciting paint illustrations that I am going to make for you right now. So let's get paint running and I will give you the lowdown wiring UI. <laughs> all right, all right. So we've got our, our blank canvas here. And bear with me on this for a second because understanding this will help you set up a game. And fundamentally, what we've been doing up to now, and Christian has been working diligently on this, um, you guys on the team who have done this in the past um, also work very diligently in our in a mulligan, our golf game on level design. So we've been talking about designing a really great environment, how to set up colliders, how to use rigid bodies so that things bump into each other and fall over. And I want to expand out a little bit and talk about a complete game. So one of the things that's really important to know in a game is the game's state. And state, what that means is, am I playing or am I paused? Have I won yet or have I lost yet? Um, without that, you know, it's sort of not a game. Like, it's sort of like, it was, oh, let's just like hang out and do a collaborative drawing. You know, that's not a game because you can't win at that, right? Like if we take turns drawing a person on a piece of paper, that's fun, but ultimately it's not a game. So within a game, you have to know the state of the game. And I'm going to draw a circle here to represent the script you use to keep track of that. And typically this script is called a game manager. So this script keeps track of things like, did I win yet? And am I playing or am I paused? Things like that. Oh, hey, welcome Tayshawn. Um, so we've got what the game is, what state we're in, and then we also have this thing I was just talking about, which is UI. And when we talk about UI, we, of course, whoop, I have a tiny little line here. What is, that's a terrible line. Ah, oh, so much better. <laughs> I just noticed Tayshawn joined and I see a Meat Boy logo. 
I don't know if you guys have played Super Meat Boy, but it's a super hard platformer. And I love the little guy. Just like that little red guy there in the chat. Anyway, so when you talk about UI in a game, I'm going to put a thing over here that says UI. You often have a script that keeps track of what you see on the screen. And this script is going to keep track of just what you see at any time on the screen. So some of the things you could see would be a health bar, a score, or a pause menu. I'm going to write those as an example of things that a UI script would keep track of. Cool. And then another very common type of script in a game is a script that's attached to a game object. So that could be a script attached to the player or a script attached to an object in Christian's game that you could knock over. So let's get our circle here. Ugh. I need that thick line. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It just, it looks bad. I'm just not a fan of that. So <laughs> the maximum thickness of the line. <laughs> okay. So here's my third circle. And this one is going to be game object. Script. I'm just going to write game object. That's it. La -da -da. There we go. And these are all kinds of things, right? They could be, like I said, on the player, on a, on a something you could knock over. And some of the common things that these interact with is triggers or uh, moving in the case of the player. So if you want to do UI, if you want to do UI, the thing you have to keep in mind is all of these things, these different systems, these different scripts in a game have relationships. So, for example, if in my game to win, I need to knock over five objects, then I'm going to want to, let's change this. What's a good color? Ha, purple. Okay, and we need the maximum, maximum thickness of line. Okay, if I want to win by knocking over five objects, I'm going to keep track of that in my game manager. I'm going to go five. And I also want to display how many objects I have collected in my UI. Additionally, when I knock an object over, when I knock an, obje an object over, I need to update that number. So to start, when the game runs, that object, that number is zero. So I start out with that number at zero. I'll put zero right here just to illustrate this. Oh, no, that can't be. I can't draw on that like that. Oh, it's hard. Um, Francis said paint.net is better a bit. He's probably right. What I really need is one of those pens. Um, I know Tayshawn had that. Those were like, have you guys ever seen that thing where, you know, you have like a digital pen and you can draw? Oh, those are so cool. I'm doing it with the mouth. So. Uh, Francis is asking, did you see my email yet about the error? Not yet. I'll take a look at that as soon as I'm done with this. Um, thank you so much for sending that. All right. So we would say at the beginning of the game, it's zero. I've knocked over zero objects. And currently my, and then I'm going to display on the UI zero. And then in the script attached to the game object, 
when that object is knocked over, I'm going to add one to this number. So it's going to be one. And then this is also going to say one. Finally, when I hit this five, the game manager is going to be like, you win. Congratulations. You've knocked over five objects. And then likely the UI will show a message that says, good job. And ta-da! And some kind of like dramatic thing could happen, right? Because when you play a video game and you win, you see something on the screen that changes. The game doesn't just end because then that's like you lost, right? You know, and of course we've done this before in the past. Like we put a sound that's like dun 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 dun. You win, right? Um, so of course audio is a whole other thing, but Commonly in a prototype, the UI right here, we would say show a UI element that says you win. And then you can click buttons like play again or something like that. So this is important to understand because all, uh, well, let's not say all because of course there are exceptions to every rule, but a lot of prototypes we make in Unity and in this, this class generally, have this structure. We have game manager, we have UI, and we also have game object scripts. And those three things interact with each other. So one of the things that you notice is this game manager is in the middle of the other two. And this script is probably the most important one because it connects what's happening in the game with all kinds of information you see on the screen. And we need that information to reflect what's happening in the game so that we understand if we're winning or losing. And so this game manager is super important. and. In fact, it's so important that if you create a script in Unity called Game Manager, you get a special icon for that script. Will wonders never cease? So actually, I'm going to hop in Unity and I'll show you guys. Um, I'm going to create a Game Manager for Christian's game. So I'm here. I'm going to hop in the scripts folder. And I've already got some scripts to work with, including one called UI Manager, um, but I don't have a game manager yet. So I right click here, I go create C Sharp script, and I'm gonna call this Game Manager. And as you can see, when I create a game manager for this game, I get a gear. Oh my God, a gear. Wow, thank you so much, Unity. This is amazing. All right. <laughs> so this is a gear because this is an important script and it's really common for people to make a game manager script called game manager. So Unity has this like built in icon. Now don't get all fancy trying to guess what the other icons are because as far as I know, this is the only special one that there is. Correct me if I'm wrong, especially if you're a Unity developer watching this cast. But typically in the prototypes that I make, I've never seen another special icon. Um, only the gear for Game Manager. And so, you know, now I have this script, I can actually start building out this relationship between the UI and the objects in the game. And I'm going to add a few lines of code here. We'll see how far we get. Um, but by the end of this, Christian will have some scripts to work with to set this system up. And hopefully you guys can follow along and do this yourself. Um, one thing I always say when I show code is um, when I watch videos where people do programming, I watch the whole video and then later I go back to that part in the video and I actually look at what the person is typing when I'm ready to start typing it in myself. So if you want to make a game manager in your game, don't feel like you got to code it up right now. You know, this isn't like, you know, hacking. This is just the basics. And you can always come back and check out the code I'm using and use it yourself.
All right, so let's open this. And, uh, you know, I just double click on it. And all of you guys have Visual Studio on your computers. We, you know, we were working with this when we did um, the survival shooter. So I know you guys know how to get in here. Um, and this is a Unity script. So what I want to do here is just like in my diagram here. Let me see if I can find my paint diagram. Here it is. What I'm trying to do with this is, okay, I want to reflect this in here. And the question that you ask when you code isn't like, oh my God, like what is the dot? What are the curly braces? Blah, blah, blah. That stuff is important. But what's really important is, you know, what is this diagram right here that I'm trying to represent into the computer? And this diagram is basically my representation of, you know, when I knock an object over, I want to add to the total number of no objects I've knocked over. And then I want that to be displayed on the screen. That's it. So I say, okay, I'm breaking that down. I've got my game manager. I need to keep track of the number of objects that have been knocked over. And what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to create a variable called objects knocked over. That's it. And I will do that by coming in here beneath the class definition. So when you, whoop, excuse me, when you see this, a variable comes beneath that. And I'm going to just say, Object knocked over. There we go. Awesome. So I've got this value in here. And what I want to do when the game starts, here we have start, is I would like to have that be zero. So, and here's the cool thing about scripting, and this is why not to be afraid of it. If you start typing, it like automatically does it for you. And this object knocked over that I typed is right here. And in fact, I can just double click on it and it automatically comes up. So I set that to equal zero. Awesome. All right. So I've got this, I've got this, uh, this variable, which is essentially just like a little box that I put a number in. And at the beginning of the game, I say, Objects knocked over that box, the number zero is in there because we've knocked over zero objects. And now what I would like to do is when I knock over an object, I want to increase that number by one. And I would do that, let's go back to our diagram here. by when I knock over an object, I send a message to this game manager to increase that number. So let's set that up really quick and just see if we can get it to work. I'm going to send out a little message that we can see in the console, just so we can check to see if the number is Increasing. I'm going to do objects knocked over. Here. And what that's going to do is it's going to print into the Unity editor what that number is. And then when we knock into an object, we should be able to see just that line being printed and the number increased. But to do that, I have to put the script into the Unity scene so that it actually does its work. And so for that, I need to visit Christian's project, find a place here in the hierarchy. I'm going to create an empty, and I am actually going to call this Game Manager. What am I going to do with this? I'm going to put this on here. And now what I should see when I run the game is 
in the Unity console, that line of code that says objects knocked over. And then what number should I see? Let me know in the chat if you know. Eternally struggling to actually dock these things correctly. There it is. <laughs> All right, so we've got some different messages in here and we're just gonna look for the objects knocked over one when I run it. Let's check this out. Cool. So I ran it long enough to generate the message. And let's make this, whoops, I like to kind of move it actually around. And ah, uh, that's hard to see. I'm going to put it back there. Fancy. So here's the console. And if you look carefully, this is written pretty small, but you can see objects knocked over zero is printed out right here. So right now it's zero because I set it to be zero. And it's just every frame that the game runs, it's saying you've knocked over zero objects. That's it. So what we want to do is we can go in one of two directions. I'm going to pull back up my paint. Woo, doo, 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 doo. Let's put my head back and check this. All right, so I've got my game manager. And here, let's check this off. Okay, I've got that. Oh, that's not a good check. There we go. Okay, I've set that up. I've set that up. I've got this in the game. I've set up this number. And now I'm like, okay, either I can work on this and work on having that number increase every time I knock over an object, or I can work on having the UI show that number. And what I'm going to do right now is having the UI show that number. And that is because I talked about UI at the beginning and I want to continue talking about UI for this cast. And then next time I will show you guys how to have something in the game world reflect into the game manager. And then the nice thing is once the UI is set up, it automatically will change and update according to what you do in the game. All right, so we've got this um, we've got this number that says zero, and so what I want is to see that number on the screen. And what I'm gonna do for this is I need to establish the relationship of this purple arrow. So I need the game manager to be able to send a message to the UI. And to do that, I need a UI script. Let's check out what this UI manager is doing, because I think this is going to be where we're going to establish this arrow. Ah, nice. Okay. So let's do this. This is already set up pretty close to how I want it to work. But I think I want to take you guys through it from scratch. So I'm actually going to delete this one. And I'm going to program it from scratch so that you guys know how it works. All right. So we've got game manager here, and I'm going to recreate that script and take you guys through it. So I'm calling it UI manager again. And of course, you can call a script like this anything. You could call it UI, you could call it Super Meat Boy. 
it doesn't matter. But I can speak from experience. The easiest way is to have it do what you think it's going to do. So if you're like naming it something like the name of your cat, you know, like, oh, like biscuit. Later, you're going to be like, what does that do? And it's just easy to forget. So, it, you know, it's your creative, creative freedom, but also like, um, you know, it, it's actually usually better to just like name it something simple. So UI manager. OK. And now we have a fresh script. So what I want to do here is I want to get that purple arrow. The relationship between the game manager and this script, which manages our UI, set up. And I'm going to write a line of code that does that. And here's your code. Public game manager. And I'm going to name this variable just game manager. And now I also need to, incidentally, I need to get um, the actual line of text that I have up in the corner, if you remember in the UI. So not only do I need to interact with the game manager, but I also need to interact with this thing that says objects knocked over, which is also a game object. So I'm going to do that in my script by, I'm going to go public text. I need this. So that I can use a text, UI, public text. Let's call it objects, not text. Again, I can name it after my cat, but I'm not going to do that because I will forget what it is. Okay, so I come down here and I'm going to put this in the update method, which this logic happens every frame of the game. So it's continuously happening all the time. And this is a common thing for many games. You know, you want to have things just running and running and running right? And checking if you run into them. So we use update for this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say objects knocked text dot text equals objects knocked over. And then here's the thing I'm going to do that's sneaky and beautiful. I'm going to go game manager dot and then this dot allows me to have access to that number. And so let me remind myself, what was the name of the box, the variable that held that number? It was objects knocked over. Objects knocked over. Now, I believe I had set it as private. I'm going to change this to public because that means I can use it in the other script and I should get no errors. I press save. It's all okay. Usually what you do when you do any scripting is look to see if there's like a little red underline. So no red underline. Let's see if we get the number zero in the UI. And then we immediately get an error. So again, I'm checking to see if there's errors, but not fully appreciating that I did create one. So let's check what that is. Ah, it's because I didn't save the script. <laughs> there's always something little like that. So. I didn't save it when I changed it to public, so it still thinks it's private, which means it can't access that number. And I actually know that because there's a tiny little asterisk right there. 
Now I've saved it. All right. Clear this. And now we have one more uh, error, which is in a different script. And I am going to comment that out because that refers to the old script. Hopefully that works. Ah, I cleared. So nice. Let's see. And so, so far I don't see a zero. So let's first check to see if my, um, box is big enough. It is. And now we can say, what could be the matter? And the answer is, again, I'm establishing this relationship, this purple arrow that links the two. And I realized I ran the, I ran the game without actually finishing the process of creating that purple arrow. And what I need to do to set that up is actually something that has to happen in the editor. So I'm going to head here and I have a couple things that need to happen. First, I actually need to put the UI manager script in the scene. And I'm attaching it to the canvas, which is the UI uh, that you see here on the screen, because since it's managing that, it makes sense that it's attached there. And then here I have two fields where I can drag a reference to the other script. So my game manager says none. I'm going to bring my game manager here. Now I have that arrow. And I added another kind of relationship, which is objects knocked over, which is this text. And that's actually right here where it says text. So now I've got that stuff all connected, and now I should see that number displayed on the screen. So let's see if it works. Great. So coming in right at eight o'clock, coming in hot, I got your UI set up. And so what you're seeing here is that zero is coming from the game manager. It's not coming from something I typed in. And we can even actually change that by, if I click on the game manager, you can see over here on the right, it says objects knocked over zero. Watch what happens if I change this number. So I change it in the game manager, it changes in the game. So that's a really nice thing to have set up because now any other script can increment can add to that number and you will see it in the UI with that set of relationships set up. So next time, stay tuned because of course, right now, this number doesn't change when I knock something over. So, you know, we can knock things over in the game, but of course, there's no script attached to that vase. That's just a game object in the scene. And to make it change this number, I need my, again, my trusty image here of the, uh, if I can find it. Da, 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 da. There it is. <laughs> By this point, people are like, we hate this picture, but I love this picture. So we've done this and we've done this. And now the final step, which is what I'll talk about on the cast next week, is how to set up this. So for this, it would be when I run into an object I can knock over, I add to this number, and it's already set up so that I see that number on the UI. All right. So that is my little summary of how to set up the sort of systems around uh, any game, any game prototype, you need UI, you need a game manager, and then you need all kinds of little scripts on game objects. Um, there's some really fun little things that we can do with adding behavior and scripting this vase. 
So definitely tune in next time because I'll show you how to do that. And, you know, I, what I would say is, you know, if you're Thomas, if you're watching this right now, um, and you look at the scripts I put in your game, you'll see they have a very similar layout. I believe I have a UI manager and a game manager in your script, in your uh, project. And then there's also some stuff in there um, where there's a script attached to the couches and chairs and stuff that sends a message to the game manager. So I'm going to push this version of Christian's project, which should go through with no problems because um, I mainly edited scripts and did not change anything in the scene. So if Christian edited the scene during this cast, he would be okay to go, um, but we'll see what happens. And then um, just a shout out to Francis specifically. Francis, I'm going to check my email right after this, and I will reply to your email about the issue you're having. Um, you can also hop in my office hours if you want from 8 to 8.30 and ask me questions about that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Overall, to everybody who's listening to this, I wanted to wrap this up just in the last minute or so here uh, by reminding folks what their goals should be. Um, so since everybody's here, it's super exciting to see you guys back. We also have Tayshawn from our other studio, who's just so welcome to, to join in and watch these casts as well. Um, so Christian, your goal should be to um, continue to build out this level. And um, I mentioned this last time, you can do it this time as well. Um, there is a function that we will use to set up the knocking over that uses tags. And to, to prepare for us to do the setup I'm teasing for next week, so for example, here's your lamp. Anything you want the dog to be able to knock over, you should come up here and tag it as knockable. So you'll tag it as knockable. And then next week, I'll show you how to do the script that goes on the game object. In other words, this one, this bottom circle, so that every time we knock over an object tagged as knockable, that number goes up. Um, let's see. So for Thomas, um, I will pull whatever changes I see in the non-duplicate version of your project. Um, so if you do any work, make sure you do it in the one that's not the, the parentheses number one. Um, welcoming Greg back after a little bit of a break. So of course, Greg, your project would be to continue to develop your environment and build out that park in the dog demo scene, um, showing us something, you know, an outdoor version of something like this, where instead of a house, we see a really nice scene that has trees and pathways and any of the assets that you've downloaded, the fountain, anything but I want to see a full park set up so that I can walk around as the dog and enjoy your level design and then start to take it to this next level. Maybe we'll even do some collectible bones. Um, Francis, your goal should be to swap out a custom car for the default standard assets car rig that we were using to prototype. So I showed this a few casts ago, um, but if you want a refresher, let me know via email and I'll show you how to do it again on the next cast. All right, I think that's everything. So I'm gonna hop into my office hours. I'll be there until 8.30 and happy to answer your questions about game making. Um, really anything you've got going on, you can hop in there and just let me know. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Ali, thank you for joining. Um, I am so happy to talk to you guys about Unity every week, and I will continue to do so on into next week and the future. Awesome. Okay, I see Francis saying he could actually swap out a car. It's just an issue with collab. All right, hopefully we can get that resolved. All right, I'm going to sign off. I'll be in the Google Hangout. Hopefully I see you guys there, but if not, have a fantastic week. I will be pulling all of your projects throughout the week and on Tuesday next week. 
So if you want to see your game on this cast, um, do some work on your project because any project where I've seen people make progress, I always pull it up and show what you guys have done and do a little bit of um, teaching and um, you know best practices or tips and tricks for how to take your project to the next stage. So I'm watching all you guys, I, and I would love to see you work on your game. So um, definitely don't think that I'm ignoring you if I don't show your game on this cast. I'm just waiting. I'm a patient person, and I'm excited to see what you have, have to work on when there is time. All right. See you soon.